Paul's letter to the Philippians. The church in Philippi was the first Jesus community Paul started in Eastern Europe, and that story is told in Acts chapter 16. Philippi was a Roman colony in ancient Macedonia. It was full of retired soldiers, and it was known for its patriotic nationalism. And so there Paul faced resistance when he was announcing Jesus as the true king of the world. And after Paul moved on from there, those who became followers of Jesus continued to suffer resistance and even persecution, but they remained a vibrant community faithful to the way of Jesus. Paul sent this letter from one of his many imprisonments, and for a very practical reason. The Philippians had sent one of their members, Epaphroditus, to take a financial gift to Paul to support him in prison. And Paul sent back this letter with Epaphroditus to say thank you and to do a whole lot more. The design of this letter doesn't develop one single idea from beginning to end like many of Paul's other letters. Rather, Paul has arranged a series of short, reflective essays or vignettes, and they all revolve around the center of gravity in this letter, which is a poem in chapter 2. It artistically retells the story of the Messiah's incarnation, his life, death, and resurrection, and exaltation. And then in each of these vignettes, Paul will take up key words or ideas from that poem to show how living as a Christian means seeing your own story as a lived expression of Jesus' story. So Paul opens the letter with a prayer of gratefulness, and he thanks God for the Philippians' generosity, for their faithfulness, and he expresses his confidence that the life-transforming work that God has begun in them will continue into greater and more beautiful expressions of faithfulness and love. And Paul then focuses on their obvious concern at the moment, which is his status in prison. Being in a Roman prison was no picnic, but it paradoxically has turned out for good to advance the good news about Jesus. So all of the Roman guards, the administrators, they all know that Paul's in prison for announcing Jesus as the risen Lord. And his imprisonment, it's inspired confidence in other Christians to talk about Jesus more openly. And Paul's optimistic that he will be released from prison, but it's possible that he could be executed. And as he reflects on it, that actually wouldn't be so bad because for me, Paul says, life is the Messiah. And so dying would be a gain. For Paul, his life in the present and in the future, it's defined by the life and love of Jesus for him. And so if he's executed, that means he'll be present with Jesus, which would be great for him. And if he's released, well, that would mean he could keep working to start more Jesus communities, which would be better for other people. And so that's what he hopes for. And notice how his train of thought works here. Dying for Jesus is not the true sacrifice for Paul. Rather, it's staying alive to serve others. And so that's Paul's way of participating in the story of Jesus, to suffer in order to love others more than himself. Paul then turns to the Philippians and he urges them to participate in Jesus' example by taking up this same mindset. He says, your life as citizens should be consistent with the good news about the Messiah. So these Christians in Philippi, they were living in a hotbed of Roman patriotism, but their way of life was to be shaped by another king, Jesus. And that might bring persecution, but they are not to be afraid because suffering for being associated with Jesus, it's a way of living out the story of Jesus himself. Which leads Paul into the great poem of chapter 2. It's rich with echoes of Old Testament texts, specifically the story of Adam and his rebellion in Genesis 1-3, through and the poems about the suffering servant in the book of Isaiah. This poem is worth committing to memory. It is a beautifully condensed version of the gospel story. So before becoming human, the Messiah pre-existed in a state of glory and equality with God. And unlike Adam, who tried to seize equality with God, the Messiah chose not to exploit his equal status for his self-advantage. Rather, he emptied himself of status. He became a human. He became a servant to all. And even more than that, he allowed himself to be humiliated. He was obedient to the Father by going to his death on a Roman execution rack. But through God's power and grace, the Messiah's shameful death has been reversed through the resurrection. And now God has highly exalted Jesus as the King of all, bestowing upon him the name that is above all names, so that all creation should recognize that Jesus the Messiah is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now, that last statement is astounding. Paul's quoting from Isaiah chapter 45. It's a passage where all creation comes to recognize the God of Israel as Lord. 
Paul's point here is very clear. In the crucified and risen Jesus, we discover that the one true God of Israel consists of God the Father and the Lord Jesus. And so for Paul, this poem, it expresses his convictions about who Jesus is, and it does more. It offers the example of Jesus as a way of life that his followers are to imitate. And so that's why Paul immediately goes on to tell two stories, first about Timothy, then about Epaphroditus, because they are both examples of people living out Jesus' story. So Timothy's like Jesus because he's constantly concerned for the well-being of other people more than his own. And Epaphroditus, who the Philippians sent with their gift, he ended up risking his life to serve Paul in prison. He got so sick he almost died trying to help Paul. But God had mercy on him and Paul by sparing him the loss of a friend. Paul's point here is that these are the kinds of people who are living, breathing examples of the story of Jesus, and they are worthy of imitation. Paul then turns to his own story as an example. So those Christians who had been demanding circumcision of non-Jewish Christians, remember his letter to the Galatians, these people are still stirring up trouble for Paul, and they keep reminding him of his own past. When he used to persecute Jesus' followers, when he tried to show his right standing before God by his zealous obedience to the laws of the Torah. But like Jesus, Paul has given up all of that status and privilege. He now regards all of it as filth. And the word he uses is actually much less polite. He's given it all up to become a servant, like Jesus, to participate in his suffering and sacrificial love. And he does all of it in the hope that Jesus' love will carry him through death and out the other side into resurrection. So Paul says that for followers of Jesus, their true citizenship is in heaven, which for Paul does not mean that we should all hope to get away from earth and go to heaven one day. Rather, heaven is the transcendent place where Jesus reigns as king. And he says we're eagerly awaiting our royal savior to come from there and return here to bring his kingdom of healing justice and transforming love to bring about a new creation. Paul then challenges the Philippians to keep living out the Jesus story. He first addresses two prominent women leaders in the church who worked alongside Paul, and they're in some kind of conflict. And so Paul pleads with them to follow Jesus' example of humility, to reconcile and become unified. Paul then urges the Philippians not to give in to fear, but despite their persecution, to vent all of their emotion and their needs to God, who will give them peace. And that peace, Paul says, it comes by focusing your thoughts on what is good and true and lovely. There's always something that you could complain about, but a follower of Jesus knows that all of life is a gift and can choose to see beauty and grace in any life circumstance. Which leads Paul to his conclusion. He again thanks the Philippians for their sacrificial gift, and he wants them to know that his imprisonments, that his times of poverty, that these are not true hardships for him. They've actually become his his greatest teachers, showing him that no matter his circumstances, he has learned the secret of contentment, its simple dependence on the one who strengthens him. Paul has come to see his own suffering as a participation in the story of Jesus. The letter to the Philippians gives us a unique window into Paul's own heart and mind. He saw his entire life as a reenactment of the story of Jesus. And you can sense in this letter his close connection to Jesus, his awareness that Jesus' love and presence is closer than his own skin. And that's what gave him hope and humility in his darkest hours. And so Paul shows us that knowing Jesus is always a deeply personal transforming encounter. That's the kind of Jesus that Paul invites others to follow. And that's what Paul's letter to the Philippians is all about. Philippians. Philippians 1. Paul and Timothy servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi, with the overseers and deacons. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you all, making my prayer with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. 
It is right for me to feel this way about you all, because I hold you in my heart, for you are all partakers with me of grace, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. For God is my witness, how I yearn for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. And it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment, so that you may approve what is excellent, and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel, so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard, and to all the rest, that my imprisonment is for Christ. And most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Some indeed preach Christ from envy and rivalry, but others from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former proclaim Christ out of rivalry, not sincerely, but thinking to afflict me in my imprisonment. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in that I rejoice. Yes, and I will rejoice, for I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance, as it is my eager expectation and hope that I will not be at all ashamed, but that with full courage, now as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. If I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me. Yet, which I shall choose, I cannot tell. I am hard pressed between the two, my desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy in the faith, so that in me you may have ample cause to glory in Christ Jesus because of my coming to you again. Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel, and not frightened in anything by your opponents. This is a clear sign to them of their destruction, but of your salvation and that from God. For it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ, you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake, engaged in the same conflict that you saw I had, and now hear that I still have. Philippians 2 So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, Complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from rivalry or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, 
work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for His good pleasure. Do all things without grumbling or questioning, that you may be blameless and innocent, children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast to the word of life, so that in the day of Christ I may be proud that I did not run in vain or labor in vain. Even if I am to be poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrificial offering of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with you all. Likewise, you also should be glad and rejoice with me. I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon, so that I too may be cheered by news of you. For I have no one like him who will be genuinely concerned for your welfare. For they all seek their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. But you know Timothy's proven worth, how as a son with a father he has served with me in the gospel. I hope, therefore, to send him just as soon as I see how it will go with me. And I trust in the Lord that shortly I myself will come also. I have thought it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother and fellow worker and fellow soldier, and your messenger and minister to my need. For he has been longing for you all and has been distressed because you heard that he was ill. Indeed, he was ill, near to death. But God had mercy on him, and not only on him, but on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. I am the more eager to send him, therefore, that you may rejoice at seeing him again, and that I may be less anxious. So receive him in the Lord with all joy, and honor such men, for he nearly died for the work of Christ, risking his life to complete what was lacking in your service to me. Philippians 3 Finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you is no trouble to me and is safe for you. Look out for the dogs. Look out for the evildoers. Look out for those who mutilate the flesh. For we are the circumcision who worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also. If anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more, circumcised on the eighth day, of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. But whatever gain I had, I count it as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For His sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in Him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith that I may know Him and the power of His resurrection, and may share His sufferings, becoming like Him in His death, that by any means possible I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained this or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own, because Christ Jesus has made me His own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let those of us who are mature think this way, and if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that also to you. Only let us hold true to what we have attained. Brothers, Join in imitating me and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. For many of whom I have often told you and now tell you even with tears, walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction, their God is their belly, and they glory in their shame with minds set on earthly things. 
But our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like His glorious body by the power that enables Him even to subject all things to Himself. Philippians 4 Therefore, my brothers, whom I love and long for, my joy and crown stand firm thus in the Lord, my beloved. I entreat Euodia, and I entreat Syntyche to agree in the Lord. Yes, I ask you also, true companion, help these women who have labored side by side with me in the gospel, together with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers, whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again I will say, Rejoice! Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, Whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things and the God of peace will be with you. I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at length you have revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. Not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through Him who strengthens me. Yet it was kind of you to share my trouble. And you Philippians yourselves know that in the beginning of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, no church entered into partnership with me in giving and receiving, except you only. Even in Thessalonica, you sent me help for my needs once and again. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that increases to your credit. I have received full payment and more. I am well supplied, having received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent, a fragrant offering, a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God. And my God will supply every need of yours according to His riches in glory in Christ Jesus. To our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. Greet every saint in Christ Jesus. The brothers who are with me greet you. All the saints greet you, especially those of Caesar's household. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit.
So in today's video, we're gonna take you through a full body dumbbell workout. Yep. Now, this is a workout you can follow along with us. So you're gonna to wanna to use a pair of dumbbells that's moderate to lightweight because we're gonna do a lot of different exercises in this video. So for reference, I'm using a 20 pound set of dumbbells. And I'm using a 10 pound set of dumbbells. So if you need a little warm up just to kind of warm your body up yep. before we get started, a lot go ahead of reps. and do that. Otherwise, we're gonna jump right into it. Let's get into it.
All right, guys, hopefully you got a nice workout. Yes, and Dropped your a nice core is sweat. on fire and your arms are on fire. Exactly. So if this wasn't enough, if you want to go for another round, feel free to do so. You can yep. do two rounds, three rounds, make this 30 minutes, 45 minutes, just kind of make it work for you.